All right. The oxygen administration flowchart is probably one of the most shared and popular things we've done uh, here at Limmer Education. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the about the genesis of this and, and what it means, and also address some of the comments we've had um, that have come in to us about this chart. I'm uh, Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. So this the genesis of this was when an educator called me and said, I'm watching my students prepare for the registry, and they're not asking themselves if the patient needs oxygen. They're asking themselves, what oxygen should I give the patient? Now, we can argue that the National Registry um, is not practice, but it's how our students evolve and how probably some of these things continue into the field. So uh, that friend, by the way, is Bob Preshong, uh, who I often don't mention his name, but it certainly deserves it. He calls and winds me up and gets me into these moods to make these flow charts. So the start of the chart says, does the patient's saturation indicate hypoxia? And one of the comments that came in uh, about this flowchart was, well, why are you putting oxygen saturation up front? You know, and I think there's two reasons why people question this. One is the old theory that, you know, can a, a device, can a piece of medical equipment tell us what to do? Um, the other one is, is thinking about how this fits into patient assessment and uh, the Heart Association, the National Registry. Well, quite frankly, the reason that I put the oxygen saturation at the top of this chart um, is largely because of the Heart Association. When they put out that 94% uh, guideline, less than 94, it really requires us to make an oxygen uh, decision that at least considers pulse oximetry. Well, when do we make our oxygen determinations in EMS? We make them early in the call, ultimately in that primary assessment phase. So as a result of that, I, I put the uh, hypoxia and the oxygen saturation up front. I think that it's a tool. I mean, in reality, what happens? You see a patient, you talk to them, you get a good look at them, and then we put it on their finger. We get the pulse, we get the oxygen saturation. Obviously, we have to verify things, but it's it's part of what we do. Why Why deny that? It doesn't replace clinical judgment, but it's part of our practice, and I don't think we should deny it either. So if the uh, pulse oximeter says, well, they're hypoxic, then you can define that as you wish, right? Um, some people say that uh, the heart associations below 94 is the guideline. I had a great conversation in an email with someone who said, um, really, people don't start freaking in, in medicine until about 90%. You know, I think that's part of EMS. We have to really kind of figure out uh, what that is and also say, okay, well, maybe there's more than one measurement, more than one way to define this. As a matter of fact, um, this section here where, where uh, we put, well, a nasal cannula will likely get them between 94 and 99, um, one iteration of this chart actually says, um, did they need uh, a little or did they need um, a lot. And, you know, that really is a, a very basic uh, judgment. You know, you can say it and you can use the saturation numbers or you can say, do they need a little or a lot? And the fact is we stuck with the one that we did um, because we thought that it gave more clinical criteria. Whether they need a little or a lot has the potential to be a more subjective judgment. So if a cannula will get them there, and I got to tell you, I really think a cannula uh, more than likely will get them there. Uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, uh, we can do that. If not, if we have profound hypoxia, um, then we're going to use a non-rebreather. But ultimately, we come down and we continue to monitor uh, clinical signs, a mental status uh, being a major one that helps us uh, indicate uh, deterioration and uh, possible uh, declining into respiratory failure. So on this chart, which I've now marked up with total scribbles, if the saturation reading doesn't instantly say hypoxia, we've had this concept where we've tried to figure out what other situations would we say, well, they're not hypoxic. And everybody's kind of all over the board on this. Well, one of the things that's been out there is, uh, does the patient have distress? Right? If they have air hunger, if they really appear to be um, working hard to breathe with uh, accessory muscle use, they've got you know, really bad breath sounds, um, agitation or anxiety, certainly cyanosis indicates really significant hypoxia, right? 
if we see those things and we say, yes, okay, we're going to give oxygen. How much? At the lowest level that adequately addresses the hypoxia in that presentation. But that's really not it. What happens if you don't have um, that respiratory distress? What happens if you have uh, essentially the trauma patient? What happens if you have the person that's ejected from the vehicle and looks like uh, it looks bad? And you're, you're talking to them, for some reason you put a pulse ox on, and the number's above 94%. Well, the first issue might be is that there might be a lot of oxygen in the blood, but there's not a lot of blood, or that this patient's condition says, you know, we should probably give them some oxygen. Do they have evidence of, of instability? Do they have um, compensated, decompensated shock and narrowed pulse pressure? They have poor skin color, temperature, condition. They have those things. You know, if they have those, uh, I think we all kind of agree it's okay to give some oxygen. Now, do we have to go with the big guns? I don't know. Um, I think sometimes we could put a cannula on and find that we could talk to the patient better. We could deal with their airway better. We can, you know, do a lot of things. Um, but here's the other thing. If the pulse ox didn't show uh, hypoxia and they're not having a lot of uh, distress, you know, significant distress, and it doesn't really appear like they're in shock or unstable, we have to be able to accept what we see at the bottom of this chart. The patient doesn't need oxygen. We came from a time in uh, about 94 to 2009 when pretty much everybody got a non-rebreather. You know, I don't know if we used a lot of cannulas. And we're still trying to come back from those things to use a, a thinking process in this. So, you know, that's the that's the concept of why we did this chart. Now, some people said, well, um, you know, where's CPAP in this? Or what happens if I'm doing RSI? Okay, well, those are those are different charts. You know, the, the CPAP is the is the overall respiratory care flow chart. Maybe that's the next one we do uh, here at Liver Education. But, um, and the concept of pre-oxygenating, oxygenating before um, RSI and preventing desaturation, uh, the person had an issue uh, with this statement here that the indication for oxygen is hypoxia. I would actually agree that uh, the reason when we're trying to prevent hypoxia and desaturation that actually is the indication for oxygen and why we do it, right? Um, and don't forget that when respiratory failure, we have to ventilate, right? Um, and that there's other things that can cause um, issues with breathing and hypoxia. If we have somebody in pain, they can't take a deep breath, well, we can relieve that pain. Maybe we have perfusion issues. You know, we can deal with that too, right? Concept of ventilation versus respiration. So I'll end with this, you know, we aren't trying to dictate practice. We're trying to interpret the guidelines that are out there to help teach students and help guide practitioners. This is only a tool in the toolbox. Clinical judgment uh, always matters. So that's the story of this uh, flowchart, how it came about, what I believe it means. Um, and uh, I guess most importantly, uh, that we wanted to help. Limer Education wants to go out there and, and do good for people that are taking their national registry for people in practice. Um, it's what we do. So thanks for listening to this. We'd love to have your continued thoughts on it uh, about this and other things in EMS. Good dialogues uh, lead to good EMS. I'm Dan Limer. Thanks for watching.